Thanks very much. I'd like to say a special thanks to uh, June and to David and to Randy for the invitation to talk here. And uh, I'd like you all to note the time now. We had a long discussion last night about keeping speakers to time, and the people were really pushing that with the speakers you've already heard. <laughs> uh, by way of background too, uh, I'm like David. I came from an evolutionary biology background. I was interested in the evolution of birds. I thought I was going to save New Zealand's endangered birds. And that's a hook for me to say I'm a New Zealander. It's important for me that you don't worry about my accent for the next 10 minutes and that you never think I'm an Australian. <laughs> okay, so a lot of the things that make us sick are alive. Uh, viruses, bacteria, uh, there's a malaria parasite, worms, the insects that transmit disease, cancers. These are all living things. And living things have, of course, tremendous potential to evolve. So when we wage chemical warfare on these organisms and these life forms, which is what much of medicine is about, we are picking a fight with natural selection. And it's a fight with one of the most powerful forces in the universe. You know that because natural selection was responsible for putting things in some pretty nasty places. So deep ocean trenches, in uh, coal mines, in very high uh, alpine situations, lots of toxic areas. Natural selection can make organisms survive and do very, very well in very nasty places. So this fight with natural selection is pretty gruesome and it's one we're likely to lose. And I want to give you an example of one that we're in, in danger of losing now. Oh, and I, I should say too, I think this fight with natural selection is going to be one of the main challenges for 21st century medicine. Okay, when you die, fail to respond to chemotherapy with your tumours, that's a fight you lost with natural selection. When an infectious disease kills you in a hospital, that's a fight with natural selection that was lost. So here's one that I worry about. This is a timeline for anti-malarial drugs. So chloroquine went into use at the end of the Second World War. Chloroquine resistance was first seen in the field 10 years later. Uh, proguanol, proguanol resistance, pyrimethamine, pyrimethamine resistance. And this story continues and plays out and plays out and continues to play out now. And you could have a picture like this for a wide range of things. You can do it for antibiotics in hospitals. You can do it for fungicides. Uh, you can do it for insecticides against uh, disease vectors. This picture of continuous introduction of product, resistance emerges, introduction, resistance emerges. This is an arms race between the pharmaceutical industry and the targets. And the WHO finally recognised that evolution occurs formally in, at least in the malaria context, in 2006. And so they now plan on malaria drugs failing. That's the expectation. So the surprising thing would be if we could come up with a new compound that dealt with malaria that didn't fail. And so the plan is to build a pipeline of drug discovery that goes on for as long as malaria exists, which in my money is gonna be forever. So somewhere way out there, we're gonna keep discovering new drugs. And this is everywhere, this problem. So you probably know now that there exist TB strains in the world that can't be killed by any known drug that wouldn't also kill the patient. That's also true of some bacteria in New York hospitals. There's simply no way to kill those bugs that wouldn't also kill people. And so they just let the immune system fight it out. They've got nothing left. These discovery treadmills, these solutions to the problem, invent new compounds, they're really expensive. It's about $3 billion for the next decade to keep the malaria pipeline alive. Uh, but it's not even clear that these are sustainable in the long run. Every second, or every next generation compound is more expensive than the last. Companies are already getting out of anti-infectives now. Those of you in the business will know that there's no money to be made in um, pharmaceutical products that are targeted at infectious disease agents. The bugs themselves are getting better and better all the time. They evolve resistance mechanisms that generalize more and more each time. So they can now deal with drugs we haven't yet invented. And then there's a the question of whether there's an infinite supply of drug targets. Is it an open-ended thing we can keep going forever? It's not clear to me that there is. So I think we have to start being a lot more smart than simply, and it's very hard work developing new drugs. I'm not for a second saying we shouldn't do that, but I think we have to be very much smarter with the ones we have and the ones we're shortly going to have. We have to start being very, very careful with these things and think of them as precious commodities for humanity that need to be looked after and cared for, not just flung at the problem. And the way I think about this is that we should evolution-proof our compounds from the outset. 
Now, I, I get in a lot of trouble using the phrase evolution proofing with my evolutionary biology colleagues who, can't, who don't like the notion that one could ever protect something from evolution. And I'm using the evolution proof phrase here in the sort of way one might talk about waterproofing of raincoats. So there are raincoats that are completely waterproof. They're often not very nice and you, know, you can get quite wet inside when you sweat and so forth. Uh, and then there are other raincoats that we would recognise as raincoats but they'll eventually leak. So you could have evolution proofing that's completely capable of lasting forever, so a compound would last forever, never be undermined by natural selection. And there, I think there are such things, and we could do that. But I think there's also an intermediate stage, which is that we could slow down the rate of failure, and I would call that partial evolution proofing. So let me give you a feeling for how I think we need to go about um, the framework for which we need to go about trying to think about this problem. At the very most basic, the speed with which evolution proceeds, and that's to say the speed with which a drug will become useless, is going to be determined by two things, genetic variation and the strength of selection. Genetic variation is obvious. If there are no resistance genes, there will be no resistance evolution. Uh, strength of selection, if it's not strong, there is no selection. It doesn't matter if those genes are there, they won't start to rise in frequency. So this is kind of obvious to me. And let me give you a picture of what evolution looks like of a single gene moving through a population. This is population genetics 101. Um, so we have the gene at very low frequencies to start with, then you impose a selection pressure on it and it rises through the population like that. And this is for a 10% advantage. In other words, the resistant gene here has a 10% uh, reproductive advantage over the sensitive in a particular population. Now, the, 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 the time to failure is this sort of time. Somewhere around here, the patients, enough patients wouldn't be responding to the drug that you'd abandon it. And depending on whether you're rich or poor, it might be abandoned down here or in here. But some, this time is the thing we seek to maximise. So in an evolutionary management strategy, we would try to, the, the thing we're trying to maximise is this thing here. And that's very, very, very sensitive, the strength of selection. So a 5% selective advantage gives you that. So the failure time is somewhere in the next room. If it's 1% or 0.1% selective advantage, it's somewhere in the next building. So if we can get the selection pressures down, we can do good things. Uh, but the flip side of that is if they go up through um, mismanagement, then those drugs can fail super fast. So if you take, oh, I want you to take several messages away from what I'm saying, but one of them is the strength of selection is critically important in determining how fast our products fail. And that's good news because the strength of selection is imposed by us, medicine. Doctors and physicians make the decisions, and public health authorities, make the decisions that determine that strength of selection and therefore how long something will last. So it's not something mysterious in the biology, it's entirely within our hands. Okay, so that means that if we're going to try and manage this, we've got these two things we can deal with, the genetic variation, this is often thought of as the mutational inputs, and the strength of selection. So the mutations matter at the start, but once they're in the population, once the horse is bolted, how fast the horse then runs is determined by medicine. And actually getting these mutations established in the first place is also a function of the strength of selection. And I think everybody would agree we should oppose no more selection than we absolutely need for, for healthcare purposes. That's, I think, kind of biology or evolutionary biology 101. But this gets me, this statement gets me into immense amounts of trouble when you follow it to its logical conclusions. And to me, that's one of the nice things about evolutionary biology. The logic of it drives you into places you feel very uncomfortable and wouldn't have got to otherwise. Let me show you. So this is a study site we have in India. We're working on malaria in India. This is a high transmission area. In the wet season, these people get malaria once every three nights. Uh, this is the old India, and here's the pylon for new India. India is a great situation because they, they are following the WHO guidelines and resistance management strategies, uh, which are to reduce unnecessary drug use, so you don't get anti-malarials if you don't have malaria. Uh, use drugs in combination, so the drugs are used to make it together, so that it's unlikely that any one bug will mutate to resistance to all of them at once. And then ensure patients comply with patient tre treatment regimens. So this is what, an example of this. These, these blister packs have a number of tablets that you have to take one a day. And in this village, they send a little kid out each day to make sure that you've taken your pill. And the pack is designed so you can see how many pills to take, and the kid can tell, yes, they've taken all of the six or whatever it is, five, tablets, uh, that person followed the guidelines. Uh, and you'll recognise some of that, at least this is also the way we play the games in uh, wealthy countries, so you'll have all got antibiotics and been told to make sure you finish the course of drugs. 
Now, it's that that I want to uh, ask about. Is that good evolutionary management? Is it a good thing to go on and follow the full course of the drugs? And where this idea came from, or this, the notion that one should do this, is, I believe, traceable back to Alexander Fleming in his 1945 speech on penicillin. So he gets the Nobel Prize, and at the end of it he says, I would like to sound one note of warning. Penicillin is, to all intents and purposes, no po not poisonous, so there's no worry about overdosing the patient. There is a danger, however, in underdosage. It is not difficult to make microbes resistant to penicillin in the laboratory by exposing them to concentrations not sufficient to kill them, and the same thing has occasionally happened in the body. And then he phrases this hypothetical illustration. Mr. X has a sore throat. He buys some penicillin and gives himself not enough to kill a strep, but enough to educate them to resist penicillin. He then infects his wife. Mrs. X gets pneumonia and is treated with penicillin. As the strep are now resistant, the treatment fails, and Mrs. X dies. Who is responsible for Mrs. X? Why, Mr. X, whose negligent use of penicillin changed the nature of the microbe. Moral, if you use penicillin, use enough. And that very powerful paragraph has led, I think, to 60 subsequent years of not thinking properly. Here's this modern incarnation, at least in the um, malaria guidelines. So this is the WHO guidelines on how to treat uh, malaria, um, riveting reading. But in it, it says, resistance can be prevented as onset slowed considerably by ensuring very high cure rates through full adherence to correct dosing regimens. So there you go, you've got to follow through. And the dosing regimens are rationally designed to get rid of every last parasite in the body. That's the name of the game. That's what they call radical pathogen cure. So you want to get rid of all the bugs. And that always struck me as kind of weird as an evolutionary biologist. Why would you want to go around getting rid of every single last drug-sensitive bug? Okay, evolution is about increasing the frequency of the resistant bugs. Why would you get rid of all the sensitive ones? Is it, on the face of it, it is not obviously the best way to go to manage resistance by letting the world, clearing the world out of every single sensitive bug and letting the resistant ones do their thing. It's just not obvious to me that that's the way to go. I have to say, I'm slightly embarrassed to really have not got into this problem for the last five years. It's worried me for 20 years, but I thought there must be something wrong with my thinking. Uh, but in the last 20 years, we started to think much, five years, we started to think much more carefully about it. The reason for, that Fleming said that, at least I think the reason Fleming said it, and certainly the reason everybody's done it since, is the argument is that if you kill bugs, they can't mutate to resistance. A dead bug isn't going anywhere fast. It's not going to evolve. And that's obviously true. So by killing bugs, you can reduce the chance that resistant ones will arise in the first place. But by killing bugs, the sensitive ones, you do it at the risk of letting all the resistant ones go. So if there is a resistant bug in your body already, and you hammer away and get rid of every last sensitive one, that resistant bug will take over and own, the, own your body and be transmitted on possibly to the next patient. So I think a priori is just obvious that there are two things going on here. And just let me cartoon this for you so that I make this point very clear, I hope. This is what a malaria infection in a single person looks like through time, parasites through time. And the aim of the game is to get rid of bugs. So that's the radical cure would do that. And that means that all of these parasites in here are no longer alive, so they can't uh, mutate to resistance. But what if there is a resistant bug already present? Either it's already mutated or that person got resistant bugs from somebody else. Then they get to take over that person, transmit on and do the thing. So that to me is the, the crux of the problem here. There's got two opposing evolutionary forces. And I put it to you that you can't from your armchair or indeed your Nobel Prize pulpit say which of these two forces is going to play out as the winner in any particular case. And it's extraordinarily likely, unlikely that there'll be a general rule which, about which wins in all cases. Now, I've learned from experience that nobody believes me when I talk about the logic of this. So uh, we've been doing experiments. And I'm going to um, take the risk of actually showing you some data here. Uh, and I've got two slides, so I'm going to try and do this uh, very quickly. First off, I want to show this is where we have put set resistant parasites into a mouse. And this is the drug treatment. Uh, so no, no treatment. You can see that the infection is dominated by sensitive ones. There's another couple of mice. Same thing, resistant ones uh, not really getting very far. This is the drug-treated case. The gray bars are we treat with drugs. Okay, up come the resistant ones. 
Okay, that's exactly what I mean. If you've got a resistant one present and you drug treat, then bang, up they come and they take over. Now let me show you this slightly more complicated situation. This is the same thing. I'm just overlaying the, in this case, the data from seven mice, nine, nine, and ten. I'm just overlaying them on top of each other. Uh, so this is time again, number of parasites in the mouse. This is the drug treatment regimen. Here's the, the one that's recommended by the WHO, go after all the sensitive parasites. This is the untreated case. We put in the resistant bug at super rare levels, and then we hit it hard with the drug, and up they come. And so the way to think about this is that red lines are bad from resistance management. So following the guidelines, bang, you get a lot of resistance. And then these intermediate doses, the ones that people wouldn't like you to use, use the drug just once or half, cut the tablet in half and use it just once, they do a better job at controlling the resistance. And if you look at the transmission, and this is the same sort of curves for getting into mosquitoes, the red is the only thing that's transmitting from the conventional wisdom. Anything else is doing better. Okay, so if you want to find a resistant mutant and spread it in the world, follow the guidelines. Okay, I, mean, I don't think there's anything, I mean, I, in a sense, we didn't need to do these experiments. I, to me, it's kind of logical, but obviously we had to do them. How do you treat patients then? Well, you've got this problem of how do you optimize these things, making the patient healthy, stopping and driving resistance, and so on. Those things are easily measurable. I should say they're opposition. The best way to stop driving resistance is not to use the drug. Okay, but obviously we need to use drugs. So how do we solve this dilemma? Well, those things are measurable. You can ask if we treat in different ways what will happen. And when we treat our mice, and I can measure all those things in the mice and stuff, the only one, which is the only regimen we've tried, which is so far the worst at all of these things, is the recommended guidelines. In fact, I'm pretty close to a rule now which says for our mice with our parasites, uh, take the drugs when you feel sick, stop taking them when you feel better, start taking them again if you feel sick again, and so on, which is the ultimate heresy. And at that point, there's probably some physicians in the audience whose sphincters are tightening because that is so <laughs> the opposite of what they've been doing. And I sometimes get a feeling that air is sucked out of the room when I say that. Uh, but I'm really trying to make the point here that it's not at all obvious that what we're doing is the right thing and it's not clear what we should do, but it's an empirically solvable problem. And just to emphasize what we're now doing, so that's the treatment regimen issue, what we're now playing with is regimens which try to contain the resistance by clearing out those parasites more slowly. And with Troy Day at the uh, University of Queens in Canada, who's a mathematician working with me on this, we're trying to use this process of competitive suppression, actually asking, can we design drugs that would manipulate the competitive suppression, that would protect our killer drugs by altering the competitive in interactions? I think there's a huge amount of mileage for products there which could protect these killers um, if we start thinking about this uh, rationally. And I'll put an exclamation mark here to remind myself, this is where I say the bit about the disclaimer. At the moment, I don't know whether the advice your doctor is giving you is good advice or not, so I'd say stick with her advice. Okay? At the moment, I think we're all ignorant about this, so you may as well stick with her advice. But ask her next time she says finish the drug course what, why she thinks that's important when you're imposing the strongest possible selection for resistance in so doing. I just want to say that there are situations where you can stop evolution proceeding even if the resistance alleles exist. In the case of mosquitoes, the problem here is that in Africa we are now doing a fantastic job of spraying house walls with insecticides or bed nets with insecticides. This is giving huge advances to malaria, uh, in the th huge reductions to malaria in Africa now. Fantastic technology targeted at the mosquito. And guess what? The mosquito is becoming resistant, uh, is already resistant to DDT in many places, becoming resistant to these py pyrethroids. A bit of smart thinking, though, makes you think, well, could we do better? So the way we do it at the moment, this is a mosquito life cycle. The mosquito lays eggs and then goes off and bites a person, lays eggs, and, go off, and she dies really fast. Each feeding cycle is really tough on them, so hardly any of them live long at all. What we do when we do mosquito control is we blast everything. The best mosquito is a dead one, is the thinking. Okay, but in fact, the malaria parasite takes two weeks to go through the mosquito. So all of these ones here... Aren't, can't be dangerous. Even if she got them and picked up um, from this first kid, malaria, she's not going to be infectious to anybody else until here. So that's what we do now, and that's what we need for malaria control. And if you actually target the old mosquitoes, then these ones here, the ones you haven't killed yet, can all reproduce and do their thing. So you're weakening the selection. And in fact, for reasons I don't have time for, because the one minute sign's just gone up, with a very small, modest cost of resistance in here, this thing can stop an evolution happening altogether. Can you kill old mosquitoes? There are chemical options, but I just want to say we have fungal biopesticides which only kill old, dangerous mosquitoes. 
this will, this, one of these would work forever. It would stop the evolution resistance. And we've shown that in the lab. We can't get anybody to, to let us show that in the field. It's too far beyond the, the standard thinking. The best mosquito is a dead one. I think the best malaria control is malaria control. Um, uh, I think what I'm engaged in here is what I think of as adaptation science. We have exquisite understandings of adaptation of things like Darwin's finches and slime molds. And as somebody out the back made the point before, it's incredible that we actually do not understand the evolution of antibiotic resistance in anything like the depth we understand Darwin's finches or the formation of these slime mold fruiting bodies, slime mold fruiting bodies. Uh, I'm glad we understand these things, but I'd really like to understand medically driven evolution much better. We have trouble getting people in rooms for meetings to discuss this stuff. The American Society of Microbiology is having a meeting about evolution proofing compounds. We've managed to get 30 people in the room. Uh, these are my take-home messages and I'll let you read them. I, uh, Randy suggested that we put up a question for the audience at the end of our talk. My question is, are there contexts where pharma-driven evolution, where failure of pharmaceutical products has a profit problem? This sure has got a, a very serious public health problem, there's no question. But everything I think about in malaria, mosquitoes and the parasites themselves, it's a third world health problem. There's no money in that, it's a constructed market. In the first world, when drugs fail, well, maybe they fail outside royalties, Maybe it creates new opportunities. Maybe drug failure is not a problem from a commercial perspective. And I'd be really interested in that because it sure is a serious and very significant problem from a public health point of view. Thanks very much.